This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This is the uh, second lecture for paper F2, uh, going through chapter two of the free lecture notes. And as you can see, it's sources of data. Uh, and it's another, what I call, written chapter. There's no calculations involved. But as with the previous chapter, uh, you won't get many questions, but you will get a few testing you on, as much as anything, the, the various bits of terminology I need to run through. Uh, but it's also data, I, I did mention in the previous chapter, that the uh, management accountant needs data in order to produce information, to produce summaries, to produce reports, uh, to be able to give to management. And so this is talking about where this data comes from, how we get the data. And you'll see, first of all, uh, paragraph two, uh, mention of what we call primary and secondary sources of data. And I won't write the full definition down, it's there in front of you, but primary data are data that's been collected for the specific pur purpose. So, you know, if I know I'm going to have to prepare a report showing what percentage of our sales go to each of various countries, then I need to collect data on all our sales, find out where every sale was sold to, and then I can put it together, summarise it as a report, and that's primary data. I was collecting the data specifically because I knew we were producing the report. Secondary data, though, is data, as it says, collected for some other purpose, but which we then use for our purposes. So, uh, for instance, maybe we're producing a product that's aimed at a specific age group. Perhaps it's aimed at teenagers. And so it might be useful for management, especially if there's a new product, to know what percent of the population are teenagers in a particular area. Well, maybe the government has censuses every so often where, you know, they collect uh, information about everybody in the country. And why don't I get hold of this census and find out from there what percentage of people are t teenagers? Well, that would be secondary data. It's useful uh, for me to be able to turn into information for management. They need that information. Uh, but it wasn't collected specifically for us. You know, the government's collecting it because they collect it for their purposes. But it's secondary. Uh, internal and external, well, I've effectively just said what it is. But internal data is data collected from our, for our own records. And then the main source, as it says, are primary data. So when I said, uh, as an example of primary data, um, Finding out for each of our sales which country they were being sold in, well, obviously that's coming from our own records. It's internal. However, external sources, well, again, my other example, uh, when I talked about secondary um, data, source of data, uh, is a census. It's external. I mean, we didn't collect the data, the government collected it, and then we're using it. It's an external source. Now, the remainder of the chapter uh, is about sampling, um, because it's not always possible to look at every single item that's available. Uh, what I'm getting at is suppose we want to know what customers think of our product. We may have 10,000 customers. It's not feasible to ask every single customer. And so what we tend to do in that sort of situation is pick a sample. There may be 10,000 customers. Let's just ask 100 of them and see what they think. You know, and those 100, hopefully, are representative of all 10,000. So if 100 think the product is brilliant, well, we'll assume everybody thinks it's brilliant. Uh, but if we're going to do that and just look at a sample, how do we go about finding these hundred if we're not going to look at all 10,000 um, customers? 
And so you're going to list here in paragraph five of sampling methods. And just let's run through them. The ideal is the first one, what we call pure random sampling. Well, we know there are 10,000 customers. We've decided we're going to ask 100 of them, and we pick them purely at random. You want them not asked to do this in the exam, but effectively, the way you go about it is you give every customer a number, 1 to 10,000. And then you just pick a hundred at random. You can actually get tables, what we call random numbers, where it might say pick number person, customer number six, pick customer number 14, and so on. Well, we're picking them purely at random. Every customer has an equal chance of being selected. Now, one thing that can hold us back a bit there is we need what's called a sampling frame. Um, what I mean there is, I, my example a minute ago, I said with 10,000 customers, I want to pick 100 at random. Well, we'd have to give all 10,000 customers a number, number one, number two, number three, number four, and then pick 100. But we'd have to know, before we even started, how many customers there were. We, we need to know uh, the whole population. the population, the total of all the potential people or whatever that can be asked. Um, and that's not always going to be possible. Anyway, that would be the ideal, picking it purely at random. Um, in practice, more often than not, we simplify it a bit to make it easier. And the next one is systematic sampling. And again, I've written below what it is, and you know, do learn these. But select, for example, every tenth item in the population. Or my example before, there are 10,000 people in total. I want to ask 100. Uh, well, that means, I think I've got it right, every hundredth person. If we ask every hundredth person, then we'll end up with the 100 that we want. Now, um, I've written against it, it's quasi-random. All I mean by that is it, it's random in a sense, but it's not purely random. Every hundredth, there's no bias. I'm not sort of ooh, accidentally picking that sort of person or that sort of person. But it's not pure random. Because uh, clearly, every person doesn't have an equal chance of being selected. You're either number 100, number 200, or you're not. Uh, over the page, stratified sampling. Again, best seen by an example. It says, um, for example, if 60% of the population are women and 40% of them are men, then if you're sampling something where the sex may make a difference, then make sure our sample that 60% are women and 40% are men. You know, because otherwise, uh, if it was just purely at random, we could accidentally end up with 100 men or 100 women. So split the population into groups and then uh, pick a sample where the same proportions, are the, the proportions are the same as they are in the groups. Again, it's quasi-random uh, in that when you come to pick your 60 men and 60 women rather than 40 men, you'd pick them at random. But the whole thing isn't entirely at random. Obviously, we said from the very beginning, we're going to make sure there's 60% of one and 40% of the other. Uh, Multi-stage. Again, um, another quasi-random, it's not completely random. Uh, but look at this, suppose a company has several thousand invoices filed, and there are tw uh, they fill 20 files. And so, 
if I want to uh, have a sample of 100, why not take five at random and then from each file take 20 at random? So there is that element of random, but we've already had some bias into it in a sense, in that we're only looking at five of these 20 files, and within each file, all right, then we'll be at random and take 20 from each of them. Just breaking it down. You know, if we've got 50 offices around the country and wanted some data, uh, perhaps select 10 of the offices at random, and then from those 10 offices, select uh, a random sample from each of them. Now, the next two aren't random at all, but are still common, certainly for things like um, people often take a sample to try and predict the result of an election in a country. Well, cluster sampling, it's a bit similar to multi-stage, but see the difference. It says, suppose a company has 100 offices through the country, each issuing sales invoices. Take a random sample of, say, five offices. So, okay, there we are being random. And then check every invoice at each of those offices. So it's not the same as multi-stage. In multi-stage, it'd be a random sample and then a random sample from each of those offices. But here, break it down a bit. Pick five offices, then check everything within that office. Now, uh, finally, quota sampling. Again, not random at all. Uh, and see the difference from stratified. It says, suppose the population is 60% women and 40% men. And we want to question a sample of 200. Well, that means if we want the 60%, 40% business, it means having, uh, having 120 women and 80 men. But the way we get it, and this is typical for things like election, forecasting elections, we just stop everybody who comes past us and tick off their response, obviously, but whether they're a man or a woman. And as soon as we hit 120 women, we don't ask any more women, or as soon as we hit 80 men, we don't ask any more men. So it's not random at all. We're just stopping people as they come past. Uh, but we already know how many of each group that we want to ask. Okay, so that's chapter two. And yet again, do go back, uh, read it carefully. You know, it's just learning the words. It's very much a terminology exercise. And uh, I should have mentioned in the, after the previous chapter, for all of these chapters, there's an online test that you can find linked from the main paper F2 page. Uh, a short test, five multiple choice questions. But do have a go, uh, you know, see if you can remember uh, what I've just spoken about.